Hello and welcome to this special edition of Vantage. We are coming to you from the Presidential Secretariat in Sri Lanka. Just a short while back, I had an exclusive conversation with the President himself, Ranil Vikramasinghe. He arguably has the toughest job in his country, leading Sri Lanka out of its worst economic crisis. We spoke to him about his policies, cricket and the neighbourhood. What does the President make of China's so-called research vessels? Would he welcome more of them? What is his equation with India's Prime Minister Modi? And does he think Jay Shah runs Sri Lankan cricket? I must say he was surprisingly candid. So this is an interview you don't want to miss. But first up, the headlines. US strikes kill at least five pro-Iranian fighters in Iraq. The precision strikes were carried out in the south of Baghdad. Washington says the strikes were in response to attacks by Iran and its proxies on American forces. North Korea says its spy satellite launch is successful. Their previous two attempts had failed. The US condemns the launch. South Korea partially suspends a 2018 military deal with the North. Japan says it's waiting to verify Pyongyang's claims. Cross-border trade between Pakistan and Afghanistan resumes. This comes after Islamabad suspended its new visa rule. The rule required the crew of commercial vehicles to have passports and visas to enter Pakistan. To protest this decision, Afghanistan halted trade on Tuesday. Dutch voters cast their ballot in a nail-biting election. Prime Minister Mark Rutte has been in power for a record 13 years. Four candidates are vying to replace him. The Netherlands is the EU's fifth largest economy. And founder and CEO of Binance pleads guilty and steps down. This is part of a $4 billion settlement, a settlement deal with the US. Chang Peng Zhao has admitted to violating US anti-money laundering laws. Binance is the world's largest cryptocurrency. We begin tonight with a Vantage interview. Just a short while back, we met Ranil Vikramasinghe, the acting president of Sri Lanka. It's been a year since he took charge. Last year, Sri Lanka was gripped by turmoil. The country was bankrupt. There were shortages of all kinds, from food to fuel. Angry citizens took to the streets. They stormed the president's office. Gotabaya Rajapaksa was president then. He fled Sri Lanka. Ranil Vikramasinghe replaced him to fix things. Today he told us about what the past year was like, whether his country is out of the economic crisis, if China is trying to exploit it, how he sees India's role and his relationship with Prime Minister Modi and cricket, if Jay Shah is running Sri Lankan cricket. Like I said, it's an interview you don't want to miss. Here's a part of that conversation. President Vikramasinghe, welcome to First Post, sir. Thank you. How are you? How have you been? Well, I must say I have survived. You have. I met you in June last year and uh, that's when you just taken charge. So, how has the last one year been for you? Challenging, but nevertheless we've got through. We've, I think government has established stability. We are handling the economic crisis. We virtually come to the last lap where the all the countries, the creditor nations have to now agree and we are restructuring the economy. We started it. There's interest in Sri Lanka. Tourism is picking up. This month, uh, the Sri Lankan Supreme Court held the Rajapaksas responsible for the economic crisis and I'm quoting from what the court said, their actions, omissions and conduct contributed to the crisis. Do you agree with the view? It is what the court has held. But do you agree? The crisis took place during their time. But the court has not announced any punishment. Do you think they should face the consequences for their actions or at, at the very least apologize? No, the, uh, the crisis took place during their time. If you take it as a sequence from the time, uh, okay, from the time the crisis took place and the delay in going to the IMF and then the resignation of uh, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa, when the opposition failed to take it over, and then there is again the crisis of uh, July, when uh, President Raja Gotabaya Rajapaksa resigned, and again the opposition was not willing to take any responsibility. It meant the whole system had broken down. So the whole politics of this country has been, as I would say, Topsy-turvy, which it's just been 
there were a lot of irresponsible actions by everyone. And yet, so I, I think I, and I think uh, you had to look into all that, not merely one part of it. How the the system had collapsed. You're saying the Rajapaksas alone are not to blame. Rajapaksas have their share of responsibility. Should they apologize for that? I think they have done. Anyway, it's up for them. The, I think President Gota had said something about this. Anyway, it, it's up for them. Then when they went off, what would have happened if no one took over the government? Yeah. It would have been worse. So it is basically the whole political system broke down because you are used to giving slogans, trying to keep people happy, and no one was prepared to take a hard decision. You are governing with support from the Rajapaksa's party. Uh, a few days ago, you also attended the birthday celebrations of uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa. Coming back to the critics, they've, they've called you, and I'm quoting, uh, a surrogate of the Rajapaksa's. Uh, what do you say to I, people like these? I have always wished Mahinda Rajapaksa on his birthday, and he has wished me on my birthday. I'm not a surrogate for the Rajapaksa. I am his, their party is split. One half is working with the SJB. Other half is with me. This is a unique arrangement. Do you sometimes feel pressure from the party? For, on sometimes certain issues? they have their requirements, they come along. Other times they won't. So it, it, it's a sort of a, not a normal parliament. Let's talk about the economy. How is the Sri Lankan economy doing now? Is it out of the woods yet? It's not yet out of the woods. It is coming out of the woods, I would say. Who is Sri Lanka's biggest creditor as of today? Who do you think? You tell me. Huh? I think it's China. It's the international sovereign bonds. That's the biggest. Bilateral creditor? No, bilateral is China. But our biggest creditor is the private. The private creditors. They form the big, largest number. And Among China the, is the biggest bilateral creditor? It's a bilateral, yeah. And yet China has refused to be included in uh, debt restructuring. Why do you think they want to separate? China them? has been in it separately. We negotiate with them separately. It has nothing to do with Sri Lanka or any other countries. It's, they are not satisfied with the terms they are getting from the IMF and the World Bank. They feel that they should have a bigger role to play in the IMF. So they have decided to opt out of it and they are going separately. It's making life more difficult for all of us who are in debt. But this is the reason. It, it's, it has nothing to do with that. It, it's something that has been sorted out by the big boys. Do you believe that Beijing has been an honest broker during Sri Lanka's financial crisis? We didn't have any difficulty dealing with them. Do you think India would agree with this assessment? Because India has been trying to bring all the creditors on one platform and China refuses to join it. Yes, well, no, we also suggested one platform. China refused to do it, it's our suggestion. So they did make your life more difficult? I mean, dealing with two groups was not easy. But then the outcome, I think, again, even if it this... Uh, even in respect to other countries, this will happen. The message is that China is sending a message to the IMF and others. So it's up for them to sort it out. China has also hinted at expanding the China-Myanmar economic uh, corridor to include Sri Lanka. Is that something that you're keen on? Well, yes. China-Myanmar economic corridor to Sri Lanka and from Sri Lanka to Africa. Does Sri Lanka want to join it? Well, the corridor is there. We'll, we'll get connected. There are no special program on that. But connectivity, yes, we are for connectivity. Also, we are for connectivity with the ports in Africa. So we will connect both the ports in Africa and the Myanmar ports. But what's, what's, what's the issue of Myanmar port? Nothing. China wants to include you in one more project. I wanted to know if you, are, uh, if you welcome it's, that. It's, it's not China. I mean, we are looking at getting integrated and we feel that the African ports are going to be important. I mean, even India knows that. And ships have been coming to, to Sri Lanka as well. Two, two ships came from China in the last one year to but Sri Lanka. But why are you asking me? I mean... No, no, yeah. no. My question is that those two ships came and the US and India expressed concern and uh, experts said that they were spy ships. Is that a characterization I, you, you agree know, first, with? First one we asked for evidence it's a spy ship. There was no evidence. Second one we had allowed it. We allowed the ship to come. And they were in this area. It was not an issue at all. What is a spy ship is, is a big um, question mark. These are civilian ships, but if there are issues, if they are spy ships, we will not allow them to come in. But as far as exploration is concerned, we allow not only Chinese ships, but other ships. But no one highlights the fact that other ships also come to Sri Lanka. Each, each time a Chinese ship comes, we get a lot of publicity. But if a ship, uh, research ship comes from another country, we are ignored. For example? 
they, 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 they come in. There's a friendship due. So, so we are going to now develop our own hydrography unit mm -hmm. and get our own ships. Then we can do surveys in, around India and China both. <laughs> That sounds like a good plan. Yeah. But in the meantime, would you welcome more such research ships from China or would you want Beijing to stop sending no, we'll them? In, we will welcome any research ship. We have no problems at all, as long as it's for research. Would you allow China uh, to also uh, dock a military ship in Sri Lanka? We have always allowed. All ships, military ships from any country, they are all docked in Colombo. So you're okay with that? Well, they have all been doing, Indians, Chinese, Russians, Americans, everyone comes to Colombo. India's role in Sri Lanka's economic crisis? India helped us, certainly, uh, with the money they gave us. You know, no, no two questions about it. Especially Mrs. Uh, Sita Raman was very, very helpful to us. Prime Minister was open. Uh, Mr. Jai Shankar was also focused on it. You've been in leadership roles since the 1990s and the India-Sri Lanka relationship has had its tough moments and good times. Do you think that the relationship is better now or than it was some decades ago? From 77, I've been in politics. I first dealt with uh, the government of Moraji Desai and Mr. Vajpai. Mm -hmm. We got on very well. I had got to know Mr. Vajpai in 1974 before he became a guest of the Indian government for some time. Uh, we got on. Then under Mrs. Gandhi, it was more strained. <clears throat> but I must say, Rajiv resolved the issues. And uh, from there onwards, we had really uh, fair, good, good relationship with the, country, with the country. Especially with Mr. Narasingh Narao. I was, he and I were contemporaries in the education ministry, so I knew him well. And even after retire, when he retired, I used to speak to him and get his advice on politics. We had Mr. Gujral, who again we knew, and Mr. Vajpai and Manmohan Singh. Mr. Man Do you share with the current Prime Minister of India, Mr. Modi? I have known him for a long time, when he was originally a Chief Minister. I know Mr. Modi from that time onwards. Uh, you attended the inauguration ceremony of Mohammed Muizu, the new uh, president of the Maldives. Yes. And on the very same day, he asked India to withdraw troops from his country. What do you make of his India Out campaign? No, Mr. The, uh, Indian troops leaving Maldives was a part of the uh, manifesto of the present president. So, as usual, I presume when he made his first speech, he asked for the, he said he was going to fulfill his, uh, I was listening to it, fulfill his requirement of, uh, require, promise to get foreign troops out of Maldives. I, well, uh, I was not surprised that he said that. But that had been a, one of the main items on his campaign. I have not discussed that with him. This is my assessment of it. Do you think this is the right policy decision? Well, for them it is something on which he got elected. I didn't get elected on that. No, I understand, but so, you're, a, you're a veteran of strategic choices. You've seen South Asian politics. Yeah, but they, they've made the choice, but I, looking at the other way, I, I, don't, I think uh, India should not uh, get too worried about it. I, I, I would say that you should focus more on strengthening our relationships with Maldives. That is the only view I have. India should not, uh, because of this incident, uh, abandon Maldives. I think Maldives needs their help, and that's what I understood from the discussions I had with the president, that he needs the help of India. He said that to you, that he needs the help of India? He said he needs the help of India. But you did not advise him on this India out policy? No, I mean, he, he, he announced it before I met him. What would you have told him otherwise? I would have told him, do it slowly. He might still do it slowly, I mean, the fact that he is not going to get it and have, do it after discussion. Is Jay Shah running Sri Lankan cricket? No, Jay Shah doesn't run Sri Lankan cricket. So why is he being dragged into it? They think that Jay Shah is supporting the cricket board. But I spoke to Jay Shah, I felt sorry that his name had been dragged in, I apologize. And he said, my position, if, if there is a, whoever is the legal body, I will back. If this, this lot is the legal body, I will back them. If the other lot is the legal body, I'll back them. 
If there's a third group, that's the legal body, I back them. I, that's not decided by me. That's decided by I, ICC. President Vikram Singh, you're a man of books. Um, and when your, when your house came under attack last year, some of those books uh, were also burnt, and you said that they were your biggest wealth. Uh, in these times of social media and hyper-polarization and hyper-connectivity, uh, how do you view politics in times like these? Are, these? are these some of the trends that worry you or do you think that you have to move with the times? Some of it worries me. The, media, the social media, the attacks on people, most of it that's uh, not true. The ability to rouse crowds, whether it's on religion or cricket or anything. I mean, these, we have to re seriously rethink of it. But also, it's, now it's becoming the politics of the 21st uh, century, of the younger generation. Mm -hmm. It's quite different. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure, as always, to Thank talk you. to you and for your patience and taking all the questions that we had. Well, thank you for interviewing me. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Now let's talk about the big news from the world of tech. There's been another twist in the Sam Altman saga. The poster boy for artificial intelligence is going back home. Yes, a tentative deal has been struck, paving the way for Sam Altman's glorious return. His enemies seem to have been vanquished. His friends are rejoicing, and his proverbial godfather, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella, is breathing a sigh of relief. The story has all the drama in and intrigue of a failed coup. We'll go through it chronologically. Starting with Sam Altman's shock ouster. Last Thursday, he received a message. He'd been summoned by OpenAI's board of directors. He was, he, he was to meet them the following day at noon. The message came from OpenAI's chief scientific officer, Ilya Satskiva. He's one of the co-founders of this company, and he was a member of the board too. Altman had his meeting with four out of five board members on Friday. And that's when he was told that he'd been sacked. Four of the five board members decided on this. One key member, the chairman of the board, was kept out of the loop. That was another OpenAI co-founder, Greg Brockman. After Altman's firing, Brockman was removed from the board. The others knew that he was in Altman's camp, and it seems they were not ready to brook any opposition. But all the board's moves seemed to have backfired. They had a revolt on their hands. Brockman quit in solidarity with Sam Altman, Altman's replacement as CEO, Chief Technology Officer Mira Murati also rebelled. The pressure was mounting. The board agreed to revise course to try and bring Altman back. And they did this on the day they had announced his ouster. It was not a great look. To quell the rebellion, they replaced Murati. They brought in Emmett Shear, the co-founder of video streaming site Twitch. This was on Saturday. And the company had seen three different CEOs in 48 hours. The board shaky house of cards was crumbling. Investors in the startup were furious. They were pushing for Altman's return. OpenAI's biggest investor is Microsoft. The tech giant has given over $10 billion to OpenAI. And CEO Satya Nadella was in firefighting mode. On Sunday, he gave Altman a lifeline. Microsoft hired him and Brockman. They now had jobs at OpenAI's biggest benefactor. Therefore, they had leverage. By Sunday, OpenAI employees were in open revolt. More than 600 of the 750-odd workers threatened to quit. They said they would join Sam Altman at Microsoft. The ousted leader now held all the cards. Both investors and employees were backing him. And yesterday, he began negotiations from his position of power. A few hours ago, OpenAI put out this message, Sam Altman is back. The only thing left is to dot the I's and dash the T's. Altman added his two cents. He thanked Satya Nadella for the support. It's almost as though Altman is thanking him for engineering his return. And Brockman has posted this selfie. It tells you all you need to know. And what of the mutinous board members? All but one have been removed. The sole survivor is Adam D'Angelo, independent board member famous for founding the platform Quora. D'Angelo reportedly switched sides early on, and he's been working to bring Altman back, so it seems he gets to stick around as reward. Another mutineer who later wavered was Ilya Satskiva, the chief scientific officer. But he's off the board, and we'll find out about his ultimate fate in the days to come. The other two board members are out, though. GeoSim System CEO Tasha McCauley and Altman's prime nemesis, Helen Toner. 
a director at Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technologies, Altman and Toner had been at loggerheads for a while. He wanted her out a few months ago. And this was after she wrote a critical paper on open AI safety practices. It seems Sam Altman finally has his wish. After her removal, Toner put out this message. So it looks like the Altman matter has truly been put to bed. But politics never sleeps, of course. OpenAI has a new interim board. It will be chaired by Brett Taylor, the former CEO, co-CEO of Salesforce. And a surprise inclusion is Lawrence Henry Summers, a 68-year-old economist who served as the director of America's National Economic Council under Barack Obama. The septuagenarian seems like a misfit on this board of young tech hotshots, but perhaps his old government contacts can help the company's expansion plans. So that's how things currently stand. Sam Altman's victory is complete. The interim board will decide on their successors soon. And Altman will likely have a seat at the table, as will his loyalists. But is there a greater role for Microsoft on the cards? Satya Nadella was instrumental in arranging this outcome. He put out this message after news of Altman's return went public. He talks about more stable, well-informed, and effective governance. How much of this governance will be under his guidance? One thing is for sure, Microsoft and Nadella will leave their mark on the revamped open AI. Here's another story we've been tracking closely, the turmoil in Myanmar. It is going from bad to worse. More than two years back, the military junta in Myanmar pulled off a coup. The generals removed the democratically elected government and they reigned supreme, largely unchallenged. In the past three weeks, though, the picture has changed. Rebels are fighting soldiers and defeating them. They're gaining ground. Things are so intense that New Delhi is now concerned. India has released a travel advisory asking citizens to avoid non-essential travel to Myanmar, meaning if it's not very important, avoid going there. What about the Indians who are already there? Well, they've been asked to be careful, take precautions, avoid traveling to troubled areas, and register with the Indian mission in Yangon. And how many Indians are there in Myanmar? Not very many. According to one claim, there are just 2,000 odd Indians in the country, but there are significant Indian investments at stake here. India is involved in more than a dozen infrastructure projects in Myanmar. The most significant one is the Sitwe port. This is a deep water port. It was built by India in Myanmar's Rakhine state. The project is worth over $400 million. Before this offensive, bilateral trade was also expanding. It had grown to $1.5 billion. And then there is foreign invest in investment. Almost $2 billion have been invested from India into Myanmar. The rebel offensive puts all of these investments at risk. And this advisory is a signal, an official acknowledgement of the trouble brewing in the country. The losses are mounting for the military. So far, they've taken control of over 100 outposts. The rebels have taken control. Two days ago, there was another major offensive. Again, the rebels came out on top. They captured 18 soldiers and 40 weapons, 4-0. The momentum is with the rebels. Their offensive has been swift and effective, and the military looks helpless. A few days ago, there was talk of a counter-offensive, but it's yet to take shape. The military has conducted some airstrikes, but they haven't been able to stop the rebels. The lost territories are yet to be reclaimed. And the troops are surrendering in large numbers without putting up a fight. Let me show you some numbers from last week. Since the rebels began their offensive, more than 400 soldiers have surrendered. They belong to the military and the police force. Reports say they also gave up their weapons. So the troops seem to be reluctant to fight. In some cases, it's, it's quite obvious. The rebels have released some pictures of soldiers who have recently surrendered. The rebels say they gave travel expenses to these soldiers. They allowed them to return to their families. And if these claims are true, the military is in serious trouble. This would mean that their troops have lost faith in the generals. They're choosing money over fighting, and the rebels are happy to pay them off. Those who did not get any protection tried to flee, many ending up in India. In the last few weeks, at least 70 soldiers from Myanmar have come to India, and this is the official figure, so there could be more undetected ones. They entered through the northeastern states of Manipur and Mizoram. New Delhi managed to send them back. But as long as this offensive continues, the risk of a bigger influx remains. Experts say Myanmar's military faces an existential crisis. 
Clearly, things are no longer sustainable for the Myanmar army. At some point, it's either going to have to give up very significant parts of, of territory, um, or it might even be pushed to potentially make even bigger concessions. Um, so um, the Myanmar military, I think, is, is facing an existential crisis at this point. The writing is on the wall. If the military loses control of Myanmar, the border with India could become more vol volatile, with more refugees probably showing up. It's a crisis that India cannot afford to ignore. Now to the big headline from West Asia, a breakthrough finally, a pause in the Israel-Hamas war. Looks like diplomacy finally came through. They have what they're calling a two-phase deal. In the first phase, Hamas will free 50 Israeli hostages, just women and children. In exchange, Israel will free 150 Palestinian prisoners, again, just women and children. All this will happen over a period of four days. And in these four days, there will be no fighting. So basically, a four-day pause in the war. Israel will also allow 300 aid trucks into Gaza. More fuel will enter the Strip. So this is what we have as part of the first phase. A prisoner exchange, a pause in fighting, and more aid for Gaza. It sounds like good news. But for the families of the hostages, it's also a period of uncertainty. They do not know who will be released in this phase. And this suspense can be agonizing. When I heard this uh, solution that uh, the government uh, make with Hamas, I feel so disappointed. Because I don't know if my Gali will be with this list that will go, go home. And I want her as soon as possible. And this feeling, maybe it's not, will be, it's make me very sad in this moment. Any person who will be released is good, is important. Uh, eventually we need them all. But if the, it's had to be slice by slice, so be it. Then we have phase two of the deal. This is where things get complicated. In the second phase, Hamas can release more hostages. They haven't given a definite number, but Israel says for every 10 hostages released, there will be one day pause in fighting, a one day pause. So if they release more hostages, the pause will be longer. If they release no one, the fighting will resume. So basically the ball is in Hamas's court. If they want the fighting to stop, they will have to release people. So for the second phase, the onus is on Hamas. That is the deal. Now let's look at the diplomacy behind it. It's been in the works for quite some time now. Four main parties were involved. Israel, Hamas, the United States and Qatar. The small Gulf state of Qatar was acting as mediator, playing what has been called an outsized role in brokering this deal. And we can see why. Qatar shares good relations with Hamas. Its political leaders live in Doha. Qatar is also a close ally of the US. So its role as mediator was not surprising at all. As for the United States, it is also said to have played an active role, not least because its own citizens have been held as hostages. So the Biden administration has a direct stake in this. Ten U.S. citizens, at least ten, are believed to be held hostage by Hamas. Plus, you cannot overstate the importance of a pause right now. More than 14,000 people have died in Gaza, more than 14,000. This, there is no electricity, no water, no food. Hospitals are overwhelmed and the death toll is only rising. For the Gaza Strip, this is a life-saving pause. The question is, when will it begin? Reports say it could start as early as 10 a.m. local time tomorrow. Qatar says an announcement will be made within the next 24 hours. It also hopes this pause will pave an end to this war. But Israel disagrees. It says this pause is not the end of the war. Listen to this. Yes, Bakhuts. There is idle talk outside, as if after the truce, to return our abductees, we will stop the war. So I would like to make it clear, we are at war, and we will continue the war. We will continue the war until we achieve all our objectives, eliminate Hamas, return all our abductees and missing persons, and ensure that there will be no element in Gaza that threatens Israel. And while fighting may pause in Gaza, across West Asia, tensions are escalating. Yesterday, the U.S. carried out airstrikes in Iraq. Their targets were Iranian proxies. They've been striking American forces. They've launched more than 60 attacks in the past 50 days. 
So this was tit for tat. And in the last 48 hours, such counter strikes have escalated. Iranian proxies target American troops and bases. The US hits back with more force. This has raised fears of a wider conflict. So while Gaza may get some relief, West Asia remains on the brink of a larger war. Now let's turn our gaze slightly northward to borderlands between Asia and Europe. Tensions are spiking in the Caucasus again between Azerbaijan and Armenia. These two nations have been enemies since the fall of the Soviet Union. They've been fighting over a disputed region known as Nagorno-Karabakh. This September, Armenia had a resounding victory. And since then, there's been a tenuous peace in the region. But now, Baku is accusing Paris of destabilizing the region. The Azeri president spoke yesterday, and he did not mince any words. France is playing a very destructive role in the Southern Caucasus. Actually, uh, Armenia became a puppet of uh, French government now and uh, this can be a serious uh, threat to regional stability. To understand his ire, we need to understand the Caucasus conflict. Armenia and Azerbaijan have been at each other's throats for decades. They fought two major wars since the 1990s, but the world has not really bothered to try to resolve the issue because of history and geography. Both Azerbaijan and Armenia are former Soviet states. They still fall in Russia's sphere of influence. So the rest of the world had mostly left them to fight it out amongst themselves. After all, who would meddle with Russia's neighbors in its backyard? It seems the answer to that question is France. Paris has been courting Armenia lately, especially this year. It's been a tough year and a tough few months for Armenia. It seems to have decisively lost Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan. The region was internationally recognized as Azeri territory, but it was home to mostly ethnic Armenians. Now, they did not acknowledge Azerbaijan's authority. They maintained de facto independence with help from neighboring Armenia. All that ended in September. Azeri forces captured the entire disputed region, and this led to the flight of more than 100,000 ethnic Armenians from Nagorno-Karabakh. They fled to Armenia. And Armenia and its Prime Minister, Nikol Pashinyan, were helpless to prevent any of this. Their traditional partner in the region, Moscow, was busy. Russia's war in Ukraine has left it little time to deal with other matters, so there's been a void in the old Soviet backyard, and France has been looking to fill that void. For months, French President Emmanuel Macron has been cozying up to Armenia. He's been sending ministers to the region regularly, and all of them have been lobbying for Armenia at international forums, trying to bring in aid and supplies for the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh. And this has continued even after Azerbaijan's victorious offensive. Armenia's Prime Minister Pashinyan was in Paris just a few days ago for President Macron's pet diplomacy project, the Paris Peace Forum. So Paris definitely has long-term plans for the Armenians. But these are not necessarily peaceful plans. In the defense field, protecting your sovereignty and protecting your people, the French Republic, in the name of these values and in the name of the special bond that unites our two countries, we are very pleased to be able to see these contracts signed today and this defense cooperation become a reality. Today, our cooperation includes the modernization of defense capabilities of the Republic of Armenia's armed forces, the education and training of personnel, the exchange of experience, advisory support in the field of reforms, the armed forces and a number of other priority areas. Long-term defense contracts, long-term military training agreements, French advisory support. These deals were announced in late October. Obviously, Azerbaijan is not pleased. And all this has led to the outburst yesterday. The Azeri president said, and I quote, France destabilizes not only its past and present colonies, but also our region, the South Caucasus, by supporting separatist tendencies and separatists. By arming Armenia, it implements a militaristic policy, encourages revanchist forces in Armenia, and prepares the ground for the start of new wars in our region. It's a stinging indictment and a stern warning. If France is not careful, another war may erupt in the Caucasus. Ten days, more than 200 hours, that's how long 41 workers have been trapped in a tunnel in India's Uttarakhand. These men were building the tunnel. On 12th November, a part of it caved in due to a landslide. None of the workers was injured, but all 41 have since been trapped. The government has tried several rescue missions, including drilling into the tunnel, but nothing has worked until now. 
Our next report tells you how India is racing against time to rescue these workers. November 12th, it was just another day for these workers. They were building the Silkyara Tunnel. This is in the North Indian state of Uttarakhand. It looked like business as usual, but their fate changed in just minutes. A landslide caused heavy debris to fall on the tunnel. The tunnel caved in and these 41 men were trapped. Thankfully, none of them was injured, but they've been trapped for over 200 hours now. So how are they surviving? When the tunnel collapsed, mounds of debris cut off oxygen supply, so authorities had to work fast. They used a pipeline that was supplying water to the tunnel. The same pipeline was used to provide oxygen, food and water to these workers. On November 21st, the first video emerged of the trapped workers. They were seen peering into the lens of an endoscopic camera. Many of them were seen with hard hats on. They also received their first cooked food, a humble meal of khichdi. Officials say the workers are in good spirits, but their families remain worried about their health. When we talk to the trapped workers, it could be inferred from the conversation that they are in a state of good mental health and are motivated. They are saying that they are holding ground and there is no problem. We wanted to tell you that sufficient quantities of food have reached them. Which brings us to the rescue plan. What does it look like after 10 days? The plan itself is simple. A drilling machine will cut a passage through the debris. A pipe, almost three feet wide, will be pushed through this passage. Trapped workers will then crawl out through this pipe. But while it may sound easy, the execution itself is quite difficult. The drilling process has faced a lot of obstacles, like loose soil and even more falling debris. Plus, there's the challenging Himalayan terrain, so authorities have to go slow or else more parts of the tunnel can cave in. We're going to make sure it's safe, we're making sure they get out alive, we're making sure the rescuers are safe. As for how long it takes, everyone here agrees we want the men out safe and the rescuers safe, and that's as, that's as long as it takes. However, authorities remain optimistic. They say the workers will be out in a few days. But for their families, the wait is excruciating. They are watching the tunnel entrance every minute, hoping to receive some good news soon. Now let's turn our attention to Africa, to the country of Zambia in the southeast. It's a landlocked country of about 20 million people and currently it's struggling to deal with a debt crisis. Zambia is not one of the wealthiest nations in the world, so it's been working to try and improve its economy. But there's a catch. Their recent growth was fueled by international debt, unsustainable debt. Zambia eventually defaulted in 2020 and has been struggling to restructure that debt ever since. But this week, they faced another setback. A creditor committee to oversee the restructuring rejected its plans, sending it back to the drawing board. Who were these stern creditors that rejected Zambia's plan? We're talking about debt in Africa, so the committee obviously features China. Our next report has all the details. Always be careful when you take a loan, because there's a thin line between a bank and a loan shark. This statement holds true whether it's an individual or a country taking a loan, as some countries are finding out. This week, it was Zambia that felt the pinch. Its creditors rejected a proposed debt restructuring plan, and that sent a jolt through the country's already struggling economy. Zambia is heavily in debt, so much so that it was forced to default on its loan obligations back in 2020. That year, Zambia's debt was worth $32.8 billion. Over 18 billion of that was foreign debt, owed to a variety of lenders. You have the usual global lenders, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Then there were loans taken from the open market through financial instruments like dollar-dominated government bonds. These are known as Eurobonds. Zambia borrowed about $3 billion using this financial instrument. 
And then, of course, there are the bilateral loans, loans issued by foreign nations. For Zambia, like for many other African nations, the largest bilateral lender is China. Beijing is usually secretive about its loans, but Zambia owes China at least $4 billion. We know this because of Zambia's efforts to restructure its debt over the past few years. After defaulting in 2020, Zambia asked for help. Its creditors got together to work out a loan restructuring plan. In June 2022, these bilateral creditors got together to form an official creditor committee. The members include South Africa, France and China. This group worked on restructuring $6.3 billion worth of Zambia's bilateral debt. And that's when it emerged that $4 billion was owed to China. This means that without China's go-ahead, no restructuring is possible. This June, the committee made a breakthrough on that $6.3 billion tranche. It was considered revolutionary, so much so that the IMF wanted to use that as a template for other nations that had defaulted. This is a breakthrough because of the way the structure of uh, the agreement is being uh, done. And uh, I very much look forward to codifying Zambia and then using it as uh, a model for other. Zambia was ecstatic. They were thanking the official creditor committee for their help. The debt restructuring that we have attained at this time, we really would like to, think, to thank the co-chairs, um, China and France. But on Monday, the same committee created a roadblock. Zambia was trying to restructure its 3 billion euro bond debt. It had a plan. The IMF was ready. The markets were ready. But the bilateral creditors weren't. They rejected Zambia's proposal. Why? Because the bondholders weren't making enough of a loss. The committee chaired by China and France wants a different deal. One where euro bondholders make a larger loss than Zambia's government or the IMF deem necessary. The logic was... If I've taken a haircut, so must everyone else. It seems petty. And Zambia has no choice but to listen. This creditor committee has a veto on any deal Zambia tries to make. Confidence in Zambia's economy has been shaken. The value of its bonds has fallen. And not just Zambia, other nations trying to restructure their debt are being seen as a risk, like Ghana and Sri Lanka. It's a chain reaction hurting already battered nations leading to a vicious cycle of debt and poverty. Now let's shift our attention back to India. When the pandemic came, India's healthcare industry was thrust into the teeth of the storm. There were many challenges, including affordability, shortage and access. The gathering storm reordered the industry, but most of all, it had one ominous consequence. Medical inflation shot up tremendously. Now, the Wuhan virus has subsided, but healthcare costs have not come down. Medical inflation is still soaring. A new report is out. It says India's medical inflation stands at 14%, more than twice as high as the retail inflation. It is also the highest medical inflation in Asia, more than that of other countries with high medical cost trends, like China, Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Philippines. And medical inflation affects everything from the cost of medicines to medical treatments and procedures. For instance, India's cost of hospitalization has more than doubled in the last five years. And this is a cause for concern because medical inflation erodes family savings. It chips away at reserves for emergencies. Let me show you how. 55% of all hospitalizations in India are financed through household savings. 23% are done through borrowings. Some borrow through credit cards and loans, some sell family gold, so the situation is dire. And this is why people avoid seeking medical care. 59% Indians skip their annual health checkups. 90% neglect regular doctor consultations. People push tests and procedures aside. They wait for symptoms to get worse, which only drives up the costs. And every year, 7% Indians are pushed below the poverty line because of this, solely because of medical bills. In fact, in 2018, 55 million Indians were pushed into poverty because of medical bills. This is cruel and unfair beyond measures. But it is no wonder, because nearly 70% of health costs are paid by citizens out of their pockets. This involves both rural and urban areas. 82% of urban households are not covered under health insurance. 
even with insurance, problems persist. For starters, patients continue to pay out of their pockets because most insurers do not cover all expenses, like those of medical aids used during surgery. And secondly, medical insurance premiums or the amount paid for an insurance policy, they've grown steadily. They rose by 10 to 25% over the last one year. In fact, health insurance claims have been growing faster than medical inflation. In the last five years, average claim for infectious diseases rose by 160%. For cataract treatment, the claim rose by 54%. And that's not all. Treatment costs are also escalating fast. So an average health coverage is inadequate in every five years, especially for those who depend on their corporate covers because companies buy a group coverage where the cost remains stagnant despite the increase in cost of medical treatments. And this is a multifaceted problem, but the result is as uncomplicated as it gets. Medical inflation is burning a deep hole in people's pockets. It is taking, a, taking an immense emotional toll and it can't be business as usual. This is healthcare we're talking about. Employers need to do better. India has a workforce of 522 million people. Of this vast landscape, only 15% receive health insurance support. The government also needs to step in. The burden of healthcare expenses is disproportionately affecting India. This is a race we do not want to win. It's a policy issue. It's not a personal finance problem. Every citizen has the right to health. So how long before they aren't? one hospitalization away from financial ruin. When someone says vampire, what is it that comes to your mind? If you love English literature, maybe Bram Stoker's Count Dracula. If you love teenage angst, then Edward Cullen. No judgment here. But let me tell you about another kind of vampires. Thousands of light years away from us, I'm talking about vampire stars. They get the name because they drain the life from their companion stars by feasting on them like a vampire. Science has known this for a while now, but now a new study is out. It says a third hidden star is involved in this equation. And this could change everything we know about how stars evolve. Our next report tells you more. For scientists, social interaction is always intriguing, whether it's on Earth or in space. Yes, space is full of cosmic relationships. We aren't talking about aliens here, but stars. Many stars tend to live in pairs. More than half the stars in the sky have a partner. But then being single is great too. And stars know this. So many prefer being alone, like the sun. But then there are some stars who don't fit into either of these well-behaved categories. Some stars are insidious and parasitic. They'd rather be in a situationship, if you know what we mean. Like the BE stars, which are fondly and appropriately called vampire stars. These stars were discovered over a century ago, but much of their existence remains a puzzle. Here's what we know so far. These stars can be several times the size of our sun. They spin very fast. This motion attracts gaseous materials towards them, which turns into a superheated belt of spinning material that the star fashionably wears in its midsection. It sounds kind of cool, but this is also the scary part. This gaseous belt the star so fondly dons is actually made up of other stars, and that's where the vampire bit comes in. A vampire star attracts other smaller stars, then devours their atmospheres. It rips through them with its speedy spinning motion. It drains the star and sucks it in, then collects the material in its gaseous disk. So if you thought you were in a toxic relationship, think again. This star is literally devouring its companions and wearing their corpse with a sadistic fashion sense. But that's not all. A new study is out. It says these stars might have helpers, kind of like wing persons. The study says vampire stars aren't working alone. There are hidden, traitorous stars that push other stars towards the vampires, supplying the vampire stars with victims to dine on. So vampire stars may thrive in triple star systems. Experts say this study could be a breakthrough in stellar physics. It can help us understand how stars die, which in turn will contribute to the study of how black holes are formed. All in all, it can help solve a number of cosmic mysteries and help us know more about stellar-sucking vampires.
After all, in the case of Vampire Stars, it seems three is a company and not a crowd. And finally, it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Australia, World Cup winning Captain Pat Cummins gets an underwhelming welcome. The Indian Navy successfully tests BrahMos missile from a warship and a Brazil-Argentina match descends into chaos as police clash with fans at a sold-out Maracana Stadium. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day, 1963, U.S. President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. The 46-year-old was shot during his Texas campaign. The president had asked about the weather earlier in the day and opted not to have a top on the limousine. The bullet hit his head while the motorcade passed through the city. His car raced to the hospital, but they could not save the 36th American president. That's all we have for you today. We're wrapping up from Colombo. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. A warm welcome. He presents Mrs. Kennedy with a bouquet of red roses. now turning on to Elm Street and it will be theaters waiting their chance to see the president as he made his way towards the trade mart. It, it, it appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. There's numerous people running up the hill alongside Elm Street, there by the Simmons Freeway. Several police officers... Just a moment, just a moment. We have a bulletin coming in. We now switch you directly to Parkland Hospital and KBOX like News Director. Women here in shock, some have fainted. ¡Puto de mierda! ¡Se lo cagó!